A reading from the first book of Samuel. In those days, Hannah brought Samuel with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and presented him at the temple of the Lord in Shiloh. After the boy's father had sacrificed the young bull, Hannah, his mother, approached Eli and said, Pardon, my lord, as you live, my lord. I am the woman who stood near you here, praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord granted my request. Now I, in turn, give him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be dedicated to the Lord. She left Samuel there. The word of the Lord. My heart exalts in the Lord, my Savior. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in my God. I have swallowed up my enemies. I rejoice in my victory. The bows of the mighty are broken, while the tottering gird on strength. The well-fed hire themselves out for bread, while the hungry batten on spoil. The barren wife bears seven sons, while the mother of many languishes. My heart the, Lord, my the Lord puts to death and gives life. He casts down to the netherworld. He raises up again. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He humbles. He also exalts. He raises the needy from the dust. From the dung heap, he lifts up the poor to seat them with nobles and make a glorious throne their heritage. Dominus Vobiscum. Et tu spiritus tuum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. Gloria Tibi Domine. Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked upon his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm and has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months and then returned to her home. Verbum Domini.
So here, right across the street from us in Irondale, Alabama, we have all this construction. So if you hear jackhammering and um, all kinds of noises during the homily. Today, as we approach Christmas, we have the great scene of Mary's Magnificat. Yesterday, we're told that she arose and set out in haste you know, to a town of Judah. This arising is a, in Greek, it's a word that, uh, that expresses some great spiritual effort that our heart's in it. She's determined. She's all in. She's giving herself to the plan of God. She's received her annunciation from Gabriel. She's going to help her cousin Elizabeth, who she's told about that is, is, you know, is elderly, is having a child, needs help. And we see that in this scene, as she, just before Mary comes out, praises God with this, we call it the Magnificat, you know, Elizabeth you know, greets her, hears this greeting from Mary, and when she heard the greeting, the infant leapt in her womb. Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice, most blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. And she says, blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. So Elizabeth praises her motherhood, her divine motherhood, we could say, and her faith. Blessed are you who believed. And then Mary has this beautiful proclamation. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord, some translations. Magnificat means magnify. You know, proclaims his greatness, his holiness. The Catechism, in talking about the holiness of God, it said this holiness is the inaccessible center of his eternal mystery. What is revealed of it in creation, in history, scripture calls glory, the radiance of his majesty. In making man in his image and likeness, God crowned him with glory and honor, but by sinning, man fell short of the glory of God. So she's proclaiming this greatness, this holiness of God, and that God is restoring the glory to us, to mankind, through his son, Jesus Christ. That holiness is the inaccessible center of his eternal mystery. And that's what we're called to share in, when we become holy, it's a participation in that radical otherness of God's holiness. And, you know, it's by grace that it can happen, and that's the goal of our life. We have a universal call, we have a command to seek holiness. That's the goal of our life, to be saints, to be transformed. So in today's event, we see well, when she enters, we see John the Baptist leaping with joy, Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit, crying out these praises of, of Mary. And then today we see Mary's great joy in proclaiming her Magnificat. <clears throat> she says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he's looked upon his lowly servant. Remember, Mary's Annunciation is contrasted with Zechariah. So he's part of the priestly class. It's his turn to burn incense in the temple, not in the Holy of Holies, but just outside the altar of incense, but it's still inside the temple itself. And while he's burning, he's a priest, while he's burning incense, he sees Gabriel, but he disbelieves, he doubts. Mary is way up in Nazareth, about 90 miles, a small, small little village, probably, scholars say, a teenage girl. She has no signs given to her to believe that this good news by Gabriel, this virginal conception of the word, you know, no signs, no reason, you know, to believe. But she has this pure faith that believes in the most humblest of circumstances. Like 30 or 50 families, they believe, uh, lived in Nazareth at that time. A big journey down to Jerusalem, far away. No cultural power, not a priest, not burning incense. <laughs> Probably a very mundane circumstance of her life that Gabriel appears to her. 
So the good news for us is that she has this joy because of her faith. It's this naked, pure faith that she has that leads to joy. And this is Gabriel's command, you know, rejoice when he greets her. Sometimes they can hail full of grace or rejoice full of grace. He's telling her to rejoice because the Lord's going to do this great work in her. So that's what Mary says. Where he's looked upon his holy servant, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me. This virginal conception that's taken place. That's the other thing. Zechariah just has to believe an elderly woman becomes fertile. Mary's faith is that she's going to conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the incarnation. That's a much bigger challenge of faith. But she goes on, he has had mercy on those who fear him. He has shown the strength of his arm and scattered the proud in their conceit. Some translations, and the imagination of their hearts. You know, we get caught up in our own world, in a worldly way of thinking, and it's a fruit of our imagination how great we are. There's no reality to it. He has cast down the mighty, lifted up the lowly, filled the hungry with good things. He's come to the help of his servant Israel. So we see Mary saying those great things done for her, and then it kind of shifts into directly great things done for all of us, for Israel, the help of his servant Israel. Fulfillment of all promises. You know, she says, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise made to our fathers, to Abraham his children forever. But the incarnation, as John Paul II said, far surpasses Israel's hope. This is more than what they can imagine and hope for. So all this scene of joy, Elizabeth and Mary, and eventually Zechariah, <laughs> that Christ is our authentic and lasting joy. The ultimate importance in our lives is to know and experience Christ, to encounter him, to have the, the, the God of grace, the miracle of this miracle of grace working in our life. That loss and suffering in our life can often bring us back to Christ. I was in the dentist chair yesterday. I pulled out my rosary. I couldn't listen to any other music. Nothing else gave me relief. I, I find that when I have like medical issues going on, it's like the rosary is the only thing that gives me peace. You know, to, to ask for Mary's help. It wasn't that dramatic, but in my mind it was. <laughs> Christ, grace has appeared uh, in Jesus Christ. And it's much greater than the drudgery of this world. Mary brings us this grace in our life. Jesus is the good shepherd who goes in search of the stray sheep. He goes in search of us to lift us up, that we may experience his mercy, that through his suffering and death and resurrection, we have salvation. We can participate in, in the glory of God. Mary's joy is absolutely linked with her faith. And then Elizabeth's exclamation of our motherhood of of her faith invites us to realize and appreciate all that Mary's presence brings to us. John Paul II wrote that this is a prelude to Pentecost, where she's by name in Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, by name she's listed as praying in that upper room, you know, praying for the Holy Spirit. Her presence in our, in our lives, you know, is the same this repeated mystery that she's imploring the Holy Spirit, she's the mediatrix of graces, that we can have this joy and this transformation in our lives. As I mentioned, Gabriel invites her to rejoice. Her joy, you know, is linked with having God with us. You know, that God having mercy and kindness towards us. And when we see that, power of God at work, it goes hand in hand with an experience of our lowliness, of how little we are in reality, completely contingent beings that were weak and sinful. 
And it has a way, I think, of fueling this joy as well because God is doing great things. You know, through his, through the Holy Spirit's overshadowing of Mary, he's bringing about our salvation. He's giving us this new life. And Jesus is to be born in us that we can have his grace, his life in us versus the imagination of our heart you know, in a worldly way of thinking. We see in the Old Testament, there's a number of births, miraculous births, infertile women becoming fertile. And oftentimes in the story, it's, you have the, the one that can't conceive contrasted with the one who can, Sarah and Hagar, Rachel and Leah, today's first reading, Hannah and Penaniah. You know, there's this contrast that Hannah is the one that's mocked and abused, but through her prayer, you know, the infertile's made fertile. And her son is Samuel. He's going to anoint King David. He's going to make one of the most important prophecies in the Old Testament that, you know, David's kingdom, there will be no end. This everlasting kingdom because Jesus comes in the line of David. He fulfills this. The Lord raises the humble. The infertile is a sign of that humility, that loneliness, and that God doesn't leave us in that state. His condescension to us is lowering himself to us to lift us up. That's the gospel exchange of the first and the last, the reversal of earthly values founded on pride. You know, taken up in the Lord, we experience every good gift. Earthly uh, fertility becomes Earthly infertility becomes true fertility. We're given grace back. We're restored uh, this glory that we lost in the garden. Israel is imaged as a woman, a virgin, a beloved wife and mother. And all these images represent what Israel is. And the woman expresses the reality of creation as well. We, even today we say like Mother Earth, but it's also, she's a special image of the fruitfulness of grace. And we see that in Mary, this good work that he is doing. We can't rejoice if we don't believe. Mary had no human claim to believe the message of Gabriel. She's got no signs, she's up in Nazareth yet she believes. She recognizes the greatness of God. We see that in her Magnificat, that he has done great things beyond our imagining. And that's the mystery of Christmas, that through the incarnation, God has entered into humanity, into our world in this extraordinary way. The world accuses God of, of allowing all this terrible stuff to happen in the world, all the horrible things that we see in the news every day. You know, it stands as a condemnation of God's existence. But God comes in this most humble little way, and then that mystery is repeated, that Christmas mystery is repeated in our life, that we can truly have him in our life in difficult circumstances and experience this joy. It's an amazing thing. We can experience joy in a in a, in a valley of tears and the difficulties that we have because God is at work.